Well, good morning. Um, it's uh, good to be with you on our first, the first Sunday of Advent, and it's good to start singing some carols. There's so many great carols which speak great truth uh, to us that uh, there aren't almost enough Sundays to, to sing them all, so it's good that we start. Thank you, Sophie, for picking some of them uh, for this morning. Uh, we're continuing in our, our look, and this is actually our last uh, uh, sermon on 2 Corinthians until we, while we take a break for Christmas and, and look at Christmas type things. Clive will be with us next week. So uh, we've, if you've not been with us so far, we've worked through the first five, four chapters of 2 Corinthians and we're now at 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And in some ways, um, it's sort of, it's a nice uh, place to finish before uh, we move into Advent and Christmas things. So uh, do have that open in front of you. Um, we'll uh, I'm not going to go through every single verse that was read, um, but the verses I'll refer to, um, and we will flip back and within 2 Corinthians and elsewhere as we go. Now, um, put your hand up if you have ever been camping. Most hands should go up, I'm imagining. Now, keep your hand up if you enjoy now, enjoy now going camping. So, there are a few hands, I, I, the ones that have stayed up, I was expecting to stay up, the ones, many of them have gone down. All right, hands down, thank you very much. Um, so, the, the reading that we have heard and the, the illustration that Paul uses is one of a tent. And I just happened to bring, and you might see me struggling with it just at the start of that last song, um, a tent. Thank you very much. You were waving frantically. There's a tent. Um, Paul uses a tent as an illustration of his body. And we need to understand why that is. Now, if we just think about tents for a moment, um, and if you've stayed in tents, you know that sometimes that getting to sleep, surviving a night, particularly in winds, uh, strong winds, can't, isn't always that good. The tent might rip. It might be leaky. It might, over time, being used day in, or week in, week out through the summers, you get to uh, the fourth or fifth season with the tent. Uh, you thought it was waterproof until it rained and carried on raining, and it isn't waterproof anymore. I think all of us know and understand the fragility and sort of temporary nature that tents have. It's not necessarily the sort of place you would want to spend forever in. A, a week might be doable, a couple of weeks might be doable, but by the end of that, you might be longing for the comfort of your home. And that's the sort of picture we see Paul trying to illustrate to us in this passage. And it's important that we understand why he is talking in this way, because actually it sounds a little bit morbid. We've got to remember that Paul as a disciple and apostle of Christ, has been through a lot. A lot of suffering, a lot of persecution. And in fact, he started his letter in chapter 1, as we, we looked at a, a while back, talking about how he felt he was on the edge of death every day. In verse 8 of chapter 1, we don't want you to be aware, unaware, brothers, of the affliction we experienced in Asia. We were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt we'd received the sentence of death. And so many times in his life, we hear and read, and we see uh, in the book of Acts where Paul was traveling, the persecution, the suffering that he felt. Last week, we looked at how he described his body as an earthen vessel, a, a clay pot that could easily be broken. We drop them in the kitchen, they smash on the floor. But a pot holding an incredible treasure, as we heard last week. In verse six, or chapter 6, verse 4 and verse 9, he speaks again of the troubles, hardships, distresses, beatings, imprisonments and riots, sleepless nights and hunger. 
He's known what it is to be beaten. In chapter 11, I've worked harder, been in prison more frequently, been flogged more severely, been exposed to death again and again. Five times I received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods, once I was pelted with stones. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I have been constantly on the move. I've been in danger from rivers, danger from bandits, danger from my fellow Jews, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, in danger from false believers. He knows what it's like to be close to death, to suffer. Now all of that is to say that's where we begin when we think about Paul describing his body as a tent. It's very natural for him because it's his experience when he writes letters to the churches to talk about the suffering, to talk about the death that he's experienced. And we see it in most of his letters, he makes reference to it, particularly here in, 1 Corinthians, in 2 Corinthians. In 1 Thessalonians, we see it very clearly, how he speaks about death. And that jars with our culture. We don't like to talk about death very much in 2023. There's a hush around it. It's, a one, of, it's one of those taboo subjects. And when it does happen, when we do come across it, many people aren't quite sure how to talk about it. We try to keep it at arm's length and not think about it unless we absolutely have to. But Paul wants to talk about it, wants to write about it because of the hope that he has. And actually, it's an increasing reality for all of us. All of us will see lots of death. And whether that is within our own families, whether it's people we know, whether it's because of old age or tragedy, as we've known within gospel within the last week or so. Currently, excess deaths in the UK and across developed countries are way above national averages, have been way above the five-year averages. Not just in the old age, in my age category. This is something that we need to be able to think about and to talk about and have a grasp of, and Paul helps us with that. It's a reality we need to face, and so I hope this morning will help uh, as we look at how Paul writes about it. Because he's authentic. He believes what he preaches, he lives what he preaches, and he speaks with a hope of someone who's suffered and knows what it is like to be close to death. So let's come back to this picture of a tent. Why the tent? Well, Paul was a tent maker. He was a man who worked with leather. So it's a natural image for him to think about as he's thinking about his uh, work when he was um, in the trade. And he knows, therefore, how fragile, how frail, how temporary a tent might be. But also, if we think about uh, the Israel, uh, the nation, how they, when they were called uh, out of um, uh, Egypt, travelled through the deserts 40 years in tents. Okay, so we've got a history of tents uh, within the sort of the, the story of the Bible. People travelling, it was the nomadic sort of lifestyle of many people at that time to travel, to move around. And where did they go? The Israelites, when they came out of Egypt, they travelled in tents until they went to the Promised Land, where they could then set up a more permanent place. And we also see that with how God was with them during that time. The Lord gave them instructions to build a large tent, where he would be with them in their travelling, a tabernacle. And then when they reached the Promised Land a temple was built in its place. So the tent is very much a temporary, fragile, frail place 
And that's what Paul is using to describe his earthly body. And he says, it will be torn down, destroyed, is the verse, is what it says. Now we know that the earthly tent we live in is destroyed. We have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands. So he's looking forward to getting rid of his tent, his physical body, and hoping for a better body. In fact, he's longing for it. In verse 4, he groans, longing to be clothed in a better body. Now, he's not talking about a better physical appearance. He's not worried about his hairline or whether his ears are too big or would prefer to look differently. He doesn't want to be a bit taller or a bit stronger. He's talking about a body here because he longs to be able to do what his purpose is better. And his purpose is to worship and serve God. And while he's in this tent, he's groaned and he's burdened because he's not able to fulfill the purpose for which he has been made. He longs to serve, love and adore God perfectly. In Romans 7, he writes about how he wished he didn't do certain things and wished he could do other things. I do not do what I want to do, and I don't do what I want to do. And it's, it, it, it's, he's had enough of it. He wants a body that's going to enable him to worship God fully. We know that, don't we? We know our weaknesses, our failings, our temptations, and our sin. And we know that when that happens, we're not able to worship God in the way that we would want to. We might long and groan for a body where we, those temptations are gone, where we can, in our physical body that we will have, be able to worship our God. He wants a house from God, and that's what he's promised. That's what he's writing about. We have a building from God, an eternal house, that will enable him and us to worship God fully. If we Think back in the the thinking of Paul. He was writing about how Moses had to put a veil over his face. He couldn't see and experience the glory of God fully in his earthly body. He wants a body that's going to enable him to be with God in all his holiness, in all his purity, in all his glory, and not die. And that will require a new body, a house built by God. That little phrase, a house not made with hands, is a really important little phrase. And we'll just look at a couple of verses that will help us understand it. So he's longing for a body not made with human hands. What does that mean? Do you remember um, in uh, John John chapter 2, Jesus speaks, he goes into the temple, turns over the tables, and he speaks how the temple is going to be destroyed and rebuilt again in three days. And then later on, um, and it's recorded in Mark chapter 14, um, the chief priests are talking about what Jesus is and what Jesus has done. And in verse 57 of Mark 14, then some stood up and gave this false testimony against him. We heard him say, I will destroy this man-made temple and in three days will build another, not made by man. So Jesus was speaking at that time about the temple being torn down and a new temple being built which would not be made with human hands. And we know he was speaking of his own body, uh, prophesying and speaking of how he would be raised after three days from the dead and given a body not made by human hands. Colossians chapter 2 speaks about um, the circumcision not made or made without hands, talking about a circumcision of the heart. So this phrase, without hands, speaks of something that isn't of people, it's of God. Circumcision of the heart that only God can do. And in Hebrews chapter 9, the phrase comes again, verse 11, and this is where perhaps it's most clear. But when Christ came as high priest of the good things that are now already here, He went through the greater and more perfect tabernacle, 
that was not made with human hands, that is to say, not part of this creation. Paul is longing for a body that is not part of this creation, that is of God, that is eternal. He wants a building that's going to be permanent, fixed, without fault, in all of its glory that will enable him to experience God's glory. He wants a new house, and he wants a better house, and he wants it in a better place. We think about uh, estate agents and moving house. He wants a better house, but also he wants it in a better neighbourhood. And that's what he wants. He wants an eternal house in heaven, our heavenly dwelling. That's what he speaks about. It's our new body in a place that is far better. Do you see the contrast? Something that's temporary and fragile, the tent that could be torn, ripped, broken, replaced with something permanent that is strong, that lasts forever, and that is what our purpose is for. And he is longing for it. Verse 8. I would prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. That's Paul's desire. He's living his life, but wants and longs to be in that better place. And he says it more clearly, perhaps, in Philippians. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. It's better. The new body is better. That's what he wants. He would be far better. Yet if I am to go on living in this body, this will mean fruitful labour for me. Yet what shall I choose? I do not know. I am torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. He longs for that eternal home. Do we have that same longing? Do we have that same understanding? Yes, we have this body that God has given us. We have the abilities and skills and the time that we have here to serve and to live for him. But do we have that same longing that Paul has? That it would be better to be with Christ, that our body and our eternal home and our life would be better if we were clothed in that heavenly building. To be able to see God face to face and experience his glory fully rather than a shadow, rather than dimly what we will see. Because the new body will have that ability. Verse 5. Now it's to God who made us for this very purpose. Now, it is God who made us for this very purpose. He's speaking clearly. This is God's intention. This is God's plan. This body that we have now, broken and marred by sin, isn't and wasn't God's plan and isn't God's plan for us forever. His plan, his purpose is for us to have a far better. Verse 5. So that what is given... What is mortal may be swallowed up by life. It's a slightly different phrase. Oh, it's verse 4, sorry. Um, We clothe with our heavenly dwelling so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. It's a strange phrase. Our bodies that we've got now to be destroyed and torn down so that we might be swallowed up by life. Often we hear the phrase swallowed up by death rather than by life. That's what this would imply, wouldn't it? If our body's destroyed, then we've been swallowed up by death. But Paul is very clear. Our death isn't a death. It is a death, a a gateway to life, eternal life with the Father. Um, You might have heard of the evangelist D.L. Moody, um, American uh, preacher from the 1800s, um, he, he, said, he wrote this, or said this at one stage. Someday you will read in the papers that D.L. Moody of East Northfield is dead. Don't you believe a word of it? At that moment, I shall be more alive than I am now. I shall have gone up higher, that is all, out of this old clay tenement into a house that is immortal, a body that death cannot touch, that sin cannot taint, a body fashioned like unto his glorious body, his glorious body, speaking of Jesus. 
I was born of the flesh in 1837. I was born of the spirit in 1856. That which is born of the flesh may die. That which is born of the spirit will live forever. This is what Paul's talking about. He wants his body torn down so that he can have full life. So many of us are anxious, so many around us are anxious about death. Paul is not anxious about death at all. In fact, in 1 Corinthians 15, have a look uh, later, he, the way he speaks about death and talks about death losing its sting, it's almost as if he's mocking death. Uh, poet George Herbert wrote a, uh, a, a it's called a dialogue uh, anthem, we well, may or may not have heard of it, where he's the, it's a Christian speaking to death. Have a listen. Alas, poor death, where is thy glory? Where is thy famous force, thy ancient sting? And death replies, alas, poor mortal, void of story, go spell and read how I have killed thy king. Speaking of Jesus. The Christian replies, poor death, and who was hurt thereby, thy curse being laid on him makes thee accursed. Death replies, let losers talk, yet thou shalt die, these arms shall crush thee. The Christian replies, spare not, do thy worst, I shall be one day better than before, thou so much worse than thou ha- shalt be no more. Speaking really clearly, although in Old English, that death cannot touch us. And although death says, I've killed your king, the Christian story is, yes, you've killed Jesus, but that has given us all life. We can't be crushed by death. So this picture that Paul is painting of getting rid of the tent, having a heavenly home, a heavenly house, a new body, that is eternal, that enables us to fulfill our purpose, which has been guaranteed by the Spirit as a deposit for us. The Spirit within us, those of us who trust Jesus, know and experience this. Know that this isn't just a vain wish, uh, wishful thinking. This is an assurance, an assured hope that we have. And it's all because of the work Jesus did on the cross and in his resurrection. It was his purpose since before time, his rescue plan. And as a result of that, if this is true, what is our response? And Paul comes to that in verse 6. Therefore we have great and certain hope. We have a confidence. We have always confidence. The translation could be, we're of good courage. We face life, we face the trials, we face the struggles, we face the difficulties, we face death with courage. It doesn't matter how close death is. It doesn't matter our circumstances. We can be of good courage. And we see this in Paul's life. We see it in his letters. And this letter to the two Corinthians is perhaps the most personal one we see Paul exposing himself for various reasons, but it gives us that picture. This man was a man of integrity. He believed what he said because of his life and his experience. And we can trust what he is saying because he was trusting one above him. We can imitate him because he was imitating Jesus. And so we should make it our goal to live in that confidence. And verse 9, so we make it our goal to please him. In response to this incredible reality that we have a body that, a future and a new body that is eternal and with him, we should live in a way that reflects that. What do we prioritise? What do we put value in? Are we valuing and putting too much into restoring and preserving this body Or are we living our lives as a sacrifice, putting ourselves out, exhausting ourselves for God's work, exhausting ourselves, using our skills, our abilities, 
and our bodies as a living sacrifice to serve him. That's what the call is in this second part, in response to what we have as a great hope. But why? Paul is doing this because he is imitating Jesus. Let's look again at this image of the tent. In John chapter 1, and as we come into Advent and think about Christmas, in John chapter 1 verse 14, we read, The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. The translation is, he tabernacled. He tented with us. Jesus, the Son of God, came from heaven and put on a tent, a body just like mine, just like yours, that is fragile, that is temporary. A body that could be torn by thorns and whips. A tent, a body that could be pierced by nails and a spear. A tent and a body that would be destroyed and torn down. Jesus, the Son of God, tented with us. And we have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father. That was Jesus' glory, to wear that tent, to wear that tent to the cross where he would die, giving up his life as a sacrifice. He faced that death so that we need not die. And we can have the, the, the body that is promised. And he paved the way for that. His resurrection body gives us a clue of what our bodies are going to be like. You can read about it in 1 Corinthians 15. It's a body not made of this world, not made by human hands, a body that was made by God. He was resurrected, and we read the accounts of him meeting the disciples after his resurrection. He was different. He was changed. It was physical. It could be touched. It could be prodded and investigated to test that it was his body, but it was different. It could appear out of nowhere. It was not a body of this earth, and it gives us a glimpse of what we have. Paul knew and understood that, and that's what he's hoping for, and that's what we can see. And so at the beginning of Advent, we look forward to celebrating again the one who came and tented with us as the one who gives us the example of what our bodies are and what our bodies will be eternally for those who trust in him and are within his kingdom. As we begin Advent, are you looking to Jesus? We've been called in the first few chapters of this to gaze into his face, to see him in the Gospels, to see the reality of who he is. Are you trusting Jesus? Because we all know these bodies are frail. What will be of them? It will be torn down. Will we receive a heavenly body? Are we trusting that Jesus is there preparing that place for us, building that house for us? As we begin this Advent season, looking at the birth, do think about the one who came and put on a tent for us, died and rose again, and has shown us the body that we can look forward to.